Watto, and I read 12 books this month so far. There's four days left, so maybe a little more by whenever this is up, but 12 as of today, and excited to talk about it. I have been really bad at doing wrap-ups. I missed July and August, but at this point, I'll just let those be lost to the annals of time. September is where we're at, and it was a really good month. Some of my favorite reads in a while. Excited to talk about them, so without further ado, the first one is Assembly by Natasha Brown. Okay, so this book is very short. It's below 100 pages, and because of that, I wasn't expecting going into it that I would have time to buy in or be moved at all, but it was super cinematic and contemporary, and for being so short, it juggles a lot of things and does it really well, which I found super impressive. There's themes of corporate America, classism, sexism, blackness, womanhood, being an immigrant, and also a lot of mental health intertwining with all of that and making some really interesting dynamics of feeling like you're not only wasting your own potential but the potential that others sacrificed on your behalf like generations of people who gave you this opportunity and you are withering away and all of it like the depressed woman moving motif is just done super well the narrator is unnamed unstable and unflinching it is so good it just delivers information so seamlessly read it in one sitting loved it has a lot to say and it's worth reading for sure then next was black swans this was not as intense it was a romp it was a really good time honestly um it was my first eve babbitts and i know her other stuff is supposed to be better but i just didn't know how high the ceiling could go and so I had a great time with this. For being nonfiction, it is super easy to read. Her Life is a movie. This is set in the 1960s. It's a collection of stories from her life that is doused in celebrity and sex and stardom, parties and romance and dancing and gossip. It's just, it's so good. Like it's fun, you know? Her voice comes off as really candid as if it's like a friend telling you a story instead of feeling like you're reading a memoir and because it comes from her directly there's just so much detail and I, it was just super readable super fun and i want to read more by her then we have my first marilyn robinson housekeeping this book was mesmerizing it was so intimate and densely written with so much emphasis on details and like these little fleeting moments of intimacy which are hard to capture hard to word but the dialogue of this just feels so familial and coded. It's like every conversation has this double meaning of being way too understood and also trying to avoid you understanding it. The conversation between adults is overheard by children because this book is seen through the eyes of one of the grandchildren. The book is about a house. Sorry, the plot. I'll explain. Um, this is a book that takes place after one of the first world wars. I don't really know the time period, but anyways It's the story about a house and the people and generations that inhabit it and the story is told through the eyes of one of the grandchildren I found the voice super compelling. It was really fun to read at some points It stops being so much about the family and more about the relationship between the grandchildren the two sisters and how they view and interact with the world a lot of natural life represented in this, a lot of small, just comforting moments. I I don't I don't know how to describe this. It was so good though. I really like this. And the next book I read was The Body Where I Was Born by Guadalupe Natel. This is another depressed woman moving book where there's an unnamed female narrator who is recounting events and stories of her life in a therapy session. And it sounds good on paper, did not love it as much as I wanted to, unfortunately. And a lot of it has to do with the voice that she took on, because it's told in the present, entirely in dialogue of her telling a story to the therapist. There's no other characters interacting, it's just her talking and talking and talking, and then kind of implied responses of, what do you mean, doctor, that sort of thing. So, because it's told in the present, every event, which is the story, basically, of her as a child from like 7 to 13 is told through a very detached, cold, adult viewpoint, which I just didn't super vibe with. 
seeing these kind of either very childish issues or very mature and like traumatic issues told through not indifference but it just didn't do it for me the way that housekeeping did and i think if i had read this before i read housekeeping i wouldn't have been so critical of it but it just felt lacking because i like knew how high the ceiling was for something like this it was fine it was kind of forgettable but i didn't actively dislike it even though i'm like complaining about it it was fine the next book i read was all the lovers in the night by miyako kawakami and overall i thought this was just okay this is a story about a copy editor like a book editor who is very obsessive and monotonous and boring and they end up meeting this co-worker that changes the course of their life and so their life starts to kind of get frenetic and go in different directions they go freelance instead of working for a company and then from there they start to day drink and go out and face the world interact with a bunch of different people and just have new experiences overall i liked it but at the same time some of the dialogue in this was so grating and robotic and repetitive and on one hand that's kind of its charm or like the point of it because it represents a lot of the disconnect the apathy the ambivalence the mental state of the narrator who is day drinking and there's an obvious disconnect in every conversation that they have but just a lot of menial small talk and low energy responses and i get what that conveys but that doesn't mean it's fun to read it it's still grating to get through conversations that go like it is raining today what it is going to storm yes it is i quite like the storms why do you like them i think of a response while i chew my fingernails like okay aside from that it was fine still i have problems other than just the dialogue there's like a whole romance aspect of this that i just did not buy into at all i did like parts of it though i liked a lot of the musings on identity and like filling in gaps within yourself i liked a lot of the talk that was abstract about light specifically light in relation to music and experiences and relating to memories i did like the writing in this but overall the story wasn't that great to me and if a book is you know no plot just vibes the vibes cannot be off and some of the vibes were off in this is the best way i can put it the next book i read was dogs of summer by andrea abru and this book was really smart and i've appreciated it more the more time i've had to digest it as a whole because in the moment i didn't super appreciate it but damn it was good um it's kind of fragmentary it's told through a lot of individual events which all aren't directly related but kind of make up the context of the world which centers around these two girls that live on an island that are friends and it's told through the eyes of the younger one named shit there's a lot of themes of girlhood and female friendship and exploring the world and life and their bodies and just coming to understand and coming to terms with a lot of things and it ended up being really smart which initially i didn't think it would be because it was kind of crass and off-putting because it was so juvenile but i think that was part of its charm and part of what it managed to do despite that or not even despite that because that sounds like i'm like invalidating bodily functions as being like beneath something there's a lot of like throwing up and peeing yourself and constant references to shitting and exploring your body pubic hair envy periods grinding on chairs and then some very crass childhood activities like pooping on barbies or shoving garden hoses up your ass or playing games in the lake where you pretend to drown and someone else has to be a lifeguard they're not all disgusting or anything i'm not like revolted by bodily functions but there is like a sense of like impurity to what they're doing although it represents a sense of childlike wonder and innocence to be able to participate in that without understanding the context of what they're doing which is the part that took the longest for me at least to come to terms with and once i understood what it was doing and what it was trying to convey i really fell in love with this it just represented a sense of innocence a sense of acting on instinct being primal but not in a way where it casts judgment or like displays them as being savage or anything it's just kids being kids and remembering what it's like to view it through their eyes and i just found it again really charming really raw really pure really unfiltered 
I like the voice of the narration too. It's told through the eyes of a young girl and the voice is just really believable. There's a lot of run on sentences, a lot of erratic trains of thought. It's just a good book. I think it's worth the hype it's been getting and glad I read it. The next thing I read was The Hatred of Poetry by Ben Lerner. This is an essay about poetry and it helped me connect to a lot of aspects of poetry that I didn't know how to word. So there are some things that I've felt before and seeing them in writing was like this eureka click in my head. Really enjoyed this. It defines poetry. <laughs> what the fuck is that? It defines poetry through what it isn't instead of through what it is or more specifically through what it fails to be by the distance between the thought that inspires the poet to write and the end result, which becomes rigid and defined and constrained by the form of the art. By it being written, it can't be anything other than the words. Instead of the abstract thought, the emotion, the art that you're trying to convey through poetry, if that makes sense. There's this abstract blob and then there's like a rigid shape once you put it into a mold of a poem. And that poetry is an empty pursuit, that the idea of the poem is more important than the poem itself, and also societally, that the idea of being a poet is more important than being a poet, if that makes sense, of being published versus being read. There are some examples of people who are terminally ill or incarcerated writing poetry and submitting it to magazines and then finally getting published and that being a defining moment, a key factor in them being seen and being heard despite no one seeing or hearing them because the general public doesn't read poetry. People don't read magazine columns. People can't recite poetry from memory. At least not everyone can. But the idea of being a published poet is universally understood as an accomplishment. And I really connected to the idea of poetry as it's described of being this anticipatory moment, the action of forming the thought instead of the thought itself. There is this analogy that I'll try and use, probably butcher, of it being like a movie theater, of poetry being the unknown, the feeling, the anticipation, the buildup, the waiting for the movie, switching reels and loading it up, the light going through the film and it coming into vision, but not fully being there. The little three seconds of it becoming the picture. That's what poetry is. It's not the movie itself. The movie would be the poem, the end result, but poetry, the idea, the abstract, the emotion, the art, is undefinable and in those three seconds of the film reel loading up the movie could be anything and then as soon as there's a picture on the screen the movie has to be that the movie has to be what you're seeing because there's no other option instead of it being those three seconds where it could have been anything and that just clicks for me i don't know if it will for you i don't know if i explained it well but something about just this raw idea not being able to be conveyed and once it is conveyed it becomes less abstract discolored it oxygenates i am rambling so much um if you're interested read it i'm sorry <laughs> i'm just i found this really interesting but i'll stop the next book i read was chess story and this book surrounds this chess world champion and an admirer who wants to play him when they're on a cruise together it's really short, but it manages to illustrate a couple things really well. One was the beauty of chess, and the other is the hardships of Nazi Germany and World War II, without it being one overly technical when talking about chess or overly melancholic when talking about World War II. I found this book to be romantic, especially in the first half, because there's such an obvious admiration for the game of chess, which seems trivial, but is so intricate and pretty. The concept of devoting your life to chess, to being able to capture a wooden piece that your opponent has, makes you realize that chess is not about the game at all. It's just the vehicle for expression and intelligence and understanding another person. Granted, I play chess, so I'm biased, but chess is so cool. Like, it's so limited, but it's infinite at the same time. Every piece has only one way that it can move. And you can see every piece at all times. There's no hidden information. You know what your opponent can do 
always. You can see their pieces and know how they move and every option they have and vice versa. The only limit is how smart you are, how far ahead you can think, whether it's two, five, or 10 moves in the future. You're trying to solve this 64 piece puzzle that doesn't even exist yet because you're thinking theoretically, you're thinking about moves that haven't happened yet. I'll stop. There's an entire other half to this book that is also really moving that centers around being a prisoner of war and I will not say more than that. This book is really short, so I feel like if I got into the second half, I'd be giving away a lot of the charm and kind of essence of this book. Sorry for talking so much about the chess part, but this was written really well. Even if you don't like chess, I think this book is worth reading. It's really short. It's really easy to get through. I found it fun. Okay, I have to go to the movies now, so I will record the rest of the books another time and include whatever else I read in September. So the next book I read was Bluettes by Maggie Nelson, and it was not what I was expecting. It was a lot more fragmentary than I thought it was going to be. Even though going into it I was expecting poetry, it ended up being more like prose or like a connected story. It was just a lot more grounded than I thought it would be, especially because the book is centered around color, blue specifically. I was expecting this ephemeral sort of abstracted idea about color and the emotions it evoked and the ties to certain events, but it ended up being a lot more referential to certain theories or ideas about the significance of color. And I found it to be pretty impactful at times. A lot of the references were really interesting on their own and looking into them was a whole other kind of joy to reading this. There's a lot of examples of people who are terminally ill or just having a limited amount of life left devoting their time to studying color or understanding it or exploring it either through movies or books or writing or just experiences and it feels like there's something really significant there to explore. At the end of the day, I just felt happy to be speaking the same language as Maggie Nelson because she is so smart. And this was a really well-crafted book. It was equal parts cathartic and celebratory. There were surprisingly a lot of parallels to the Ben Lerner essay, which I kind of read preparing for this about trying and failing to capture something. In this, it would be color failing to describe it, to convey it, to even utter something's blueness directly, trying and failing and building up this zenith, this paradise, this giant artifact of blueness internally, and then presenting in this book what ends up being a molehill, but it's still a really pretty molehill at that. I thought that this was great. After Bluettes, I read Fox 8 by George Saunders and did not enjoy it. It was more that I didn't enjoy reading it actively. After I finished it, I think it's fine or almost fine, but the way that this was written in like this broken English from the perspective of an animal, it reads so annoyingly. It's like if someone took a Jomney Sun tweet, but instead of 140 characters, they turn it into an entire book. It just becomes grating. Humans are like to evil AF. The only thing that the language adds to the book is a layer of resistance while reading it that to me was just really infuriating. I finished this because it was super short and then like the point that it's trying to make of like people bad or I don't know, be nice is was just like, the, the book was bad, it's okay. <laughs> After that, I read Paradise Rot by Jenny Haval and I loved this book. I loved it so much that I'm struggling to describe what made it good. I found this hypnotic and surreal and unnerving in a really digestible way. A lot of the descriptions in this book focus on senses and it was so vivid about hearing specifically. A very desolate and uncanny setting that takes place in this semi-abandoned factory that's simultaneously empty and also inhabited by hundreds of noises, the sinews of fabrics, skin touching skin, spit bubbling at the corners of someone's mouth as they talk, teeth that break the flesh of apples, and a lot of peeing. 
In some ways, this feels like a mix of Moshfeg and Murakami with a focus on the body's sort of understated or underrepresented functions through the eyes of someone who is very listless and sexually frustrated. I'm comparing this for clarity, but her voice feels very distinct. This was a great translation. I don't know, I just really like this book. It's one of my favorite reads of the year. Not that it even did anything revelatory, but it was just a great experience of reading it, and it's so short that it doesn't have time to miss the mark at any point. Yeah, I just really like this one. Thanks to Kent Bell and Maddie for getting me to read this because I really liked it. And then a book that I read yesterday was The Stranger by Albert Camus. Still processing. It's a doozy. I haven't had this feeling in a super long time where I finished the book and immediately wanted to reread it because there's so much going on, there's so much to unpack, there's so much that I want to know more about and knowing what happens I want to reread the beginning with that different context. This is a story that is focusing on the absurdity of not only humanity, of bureaucracy, of life, of death, of emotions feels similar to taxi driver the movie where you're seeing the eyes of this very callous and cold apathetic almost sociopathic or just neurotic narrator who is going through life in comically absurd situations where things are laid out and then later relayed and you realize the absurdity of what happened initially because while you're seeing it through their eyes you don't recognize it as being wrong or morose or questionable at all but the premise of this book is there's a man accused of a murder and it's about his sort of trial and so you see the first half of the events leading up to the murder and then afterwards it's the trial and seeing the before and after of events through his eyes versus events through the eyes of the public through the prosecutor through the judges it's just really smart it foreshadows so well without it ever being overbearing or without it ever seeming on the nose really entertaining it's really short also there's just a lot like like i said i already want to reread it and i just finished it but really enjoyed it and right now i am reading a single man by christopher isherwood I'm not done with it so i won't talk about it i'll just include it the next time i talk about books which will hopefully not be in three months again but we'll see um yeah so it's been a while since i've made kind of a video so i have a bunch of b-roll that i'm going to put at the end kind of just little vlog of the last month that i've been mia some bookshelf reorganizing also because that's different um yeah so just gonna montage that i don't think i will talk again in this video so thanks for watching and goodbye